Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, YouTubers. Jerry Diamond with How to Get Out of Babylon. Reading We Interrupt This Program by A.T. Hagen. July 4th, Independence Day, Part 2. Reaching the edge of the field. They went through the gate and headed towards the tables under the trees, stopping first at the water hose by the barn to wash their faces and hands. Mike, Kate, Stevie, and Timmy Daniels were already there. Yep. Headship. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, I'm going to keep reading. I'll just plug it in. Mm. Ellie was opening the covers on the barbecues and removing smoking pieces of meat as Ann brought out bowls of potato salad. Lisa was lowering a big basket of sweet corn into a cauldron of boiling water hung over a wood fire. She had just broke the ears and shucked it minutes before. A whiff of smoke from the grills made John's stomach growl. A truck pulled up at the gate and Ed got out. Behind him came Jimmy Bryant, his brother Dan, Sally Starling, and her two children. There we go. They had all just come through the gate when the Hatchers arrived with Miguel and his family following behind. With them came pots and bowls and coolers which they began to deploy at Ellie's direction. Feels like old times, John said. Too bad there aren't any feral dogs left. We could have a hunt. Give it a couple years and we could hunt quail. I flushed two cubbies this morning, Ed Strickland said, more than I've seen in quite a while. No stray cats around to eat up the babies, so they're beginning to make a comeback. Something to look forward to, Jimmy added. I enjoyed those hunts. Be happy never to have to ride with the posse again, though. Had enough of that to last me a lifetime. Very true, my friend, McGill said. I, for one, hope to rest upon my laurels in the man-hunting business, but a spot of bird hunting would suit me if ever such ammunition comes back onto the market. My distributor tells me that perhaps by the end of the year they'll have such for civilian sale again, but cannot promise anything. Enough nostalgia, Ellie interjected. The food's ready. Let's eat. The gathering sat to the table, then bowed their heads as John gave the grace. When he finished, Lisa gave him the sign, and he lifted the basket of corn out of the water. The smell of the ears blowing across the table and, a, and exciting many interesting looks. Eliciting many, say, eliciting many interesting looks. He set the basket down into a shallow pan on the table and took his place again. Food was passed around and the plates filled. Little was said as everyone sampled fresh corn, barbecue hot off the grill, home-baked beans, and fruit jars of cold iced tea. Presently, Ed asked John, You going to set up at the market in the morning? Weather's supposed to be pretty clear tomorrow. John nodded his head. Yes, we are. I'll take the girls in, set them up, leave the trailer, and come on back to the house. The dew shouldn't be off the grass yet, so I won't miss any good cutting time. Along about dinner, I'll knock off, go and pick them up, and bring them home. After we've eaten, I'll spend the rest of the day cutting, and the girls can tear out what's already been cut. Sounds like a plan, then, Ed said. You reckon they'll be all right there by themselves? Anne will be with them probably working school lessons into everything like she always does. His wife stuck her tongue out at him but said nothing. Butch will be there to help out if she needs it, but if the kids have the, but the, kids have the routine pretty well knocked. Miguel chuckled and said with a grin, After the flim-flam you all performed on our fine gentleman from the revenue department, I think anyone who would attempt to cheat your girls would think twice. John grinned widely and said, Now, Miguel, that was not a flim-flam. We merely cooperated with the revenue department in carrying out our civic duty. Jimmy snorted. You mean you buffaloed them agents into treating you the way civil servants are supposed to treat people and made them like it to boot? A chuckle ran around the table as John denuded his ear of corn. Why should they feel buffaloed, he asked when he he'd finished with the ear. Weren't we cooperative? <clears throat> Didn't Butch sign up to collect the sales tax like he was supposed to? Now granted, Agent Hill did seem a trifle disappointed to discover that Horn Farm sold nothing that could be taxed, but he got over it. The other traders who needed to sign up did as well, all nice and cooperative, just like they were supposed to. All nice and cooperative, just like they were supposed to, Mike Daniel mimicked John's voice, then continued, while neglecting to mention <coughs> the small fact that Ross Hendry, state house rep for West Alachua County, and Steve Williams, state senator for Alachua and Gilchrist counties, were there watching the entire proceedings. I'd have given a pretty penny to have been there to see his face when Huck Finch told that revenue agent who they were. 
He thought he'd be doing some buffaloing of his own when he managed to get Huck and half the state troopers in the Gainesville barracks ordered out to accompany him to the Archer Market to force you guys into compliance. Instead, he had to swallow that arrogant attitude he brought with him and simply help everyone fill out their forms properly. Polite-like. John, that was as fine a piece of manipulation as I've ever heard of. Well, why shouldn't they be there? John asked in an innocent tone. They represent us in Tallahassee, don't they? It's only natural they'd want to get out and meet their constituency at the market to press the flesh and kiss babies, but just to be clear, I didn't invite them. I'd never met the two before. You need to apply to Mr. Alvarez here for Ross Hendry being there. He's the one who gave him the heads up. It was Abel Webster who's got the building supply business that invited Senator Williams. They're first cousins, it turns out. But who masterminded it all, Mike persisted. Everyone knows that you and Butch put it all together. Only partially true, actually, John explained. We did call a meeting of all the market traders after the market closed. I was the one who suggested that we'd probably be treated with a lot more respect if we had some local authorities present to witness the proceedings. But like I said, I don't know any reps or senators. It was Abel who mentioned that his cousin was our state senator. Carolita here brought up the fact that Miguel knew Ross. We just sort of laid out the plan of action. It was actually more work to convince everyone to cooperate with the revenuers. Once we explained that paper dollars were inflating away by the day, but barter goods not only held their value, but mainly actually, but many actually increased, that took the sting out, of, out somewhat, particularly since it would be very difficult, maybe outright impossible, for the state to check on whether appropriate sales taxes were being paid from barter deals. We all agreed to clearly mark our signs, plus 7% state and county sales tax for those who had to collect such, which in turn will probably start making itself felt on the political level. I'm afraid we neglected to mention that last little fact to Ross and Steve when they were there, but I'm sure it will begin to come to their attention in the near future. Not that I expect anything will come of it, but it may just make Agent Hill less popular with certain legislatures in Tallahassee in the future. John reached into the corn basket, pulled out another ear, dipped it into the can of melted butter, and commenced to eating it, saying nothing more of the episode with the revenue department at the Archer Market. Conversation turned to other areas, and the meal was gradually consumed. When everyone had their fill of the main course, the men fished watermelons out of the ice-filled wash tubs they'd been placed in earlier and cut them up with machetes, passing out slices as they were chopped off. Ed pulled out his pocket knife and began to cut off bite-sized pieces of melon and eating them. Now this really takes me back. I can remember doing this with my dad's family every summer before the war in 1941 when I was just a youngster. We'd work and sweat all morning until noon, come to the house, rinse off at the pump, eat at the tables under the pecan trees. Daddy or one of the uncles would come from town on the 4th with big blocks of ice to chip to put in the tea or lemonade, and there'd be big old watermelons and wash tubs chilling. No one had any money to buy anything new, but we all ate. We all made do with what we had, and if we were poor, I didn't know any better. He spit out a few seeds and continued, that's what this feels like today. Almost like the last 50 years never happened at all. Here we are cutting hay, picking fruit and vegetables and putting them up. No one's got any money, but we're still having a big old picnic on the 4th with barbecue and cold melons. John nodded his head. Yep, we do seem to be entering a strange dichotomy here. On the one hand, we've got home computers, the Internet, modern medicine, and on the other hand, we're all out here cutting hay and putting up food for the winter. You know, I think I like it. All right. We'll see y'all. Thank you.